Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felden. All right, once again, program number four this afternoon. And uh, for those of you joining us on television, again, we just appreciate all that you do to help us. And uh, the good comments, my, I think I've said it before, we rarely, we rarely get anybody that gives us a bad time once in a while, but then it's not bad. So we do. We appreciate all the good mail and uh, the phone calls. And then for those of you in the studio, my, how we appreciate that all of you come in and uh, become a part of this. And for those of you out in television, you ought to come in some Wednesday and uh, be part of this fellowship. We uh, almost have a hard time getting them back in here for the program. Okay, let's get right back to where we left off. We were in uh, 1 John chapter 2, and for those of you, if you want to order this particular program, ask for book number 56, all right? Book number 56, which of course includes 12 programs, not just one. All right, 1 John chapter 2, and uh, just for sake of bringing us back up to where we left off, John is now dealing with the signs of the soon coming of the Messiah. Now, again, I'm going to keep repeating it and keep repeating it in case somebody has missed it or if you're just new and turning, uh, tuning in that these little Jewish epistles now are just a continuation of the Old Testament prophecies. They have no concept that the church age is going to intervene. There is nothing of church language in here. Even though, because we're dealing with the same God, there are certain things, as we've been showing now, some things will probably correlate with what Paul says. In fact, John's Gospel does to a certain degree. But it is still the kingdom economy dealing with Israel and presenting the coming of their Messiah. Now, of course, for the second time that he is going to return and yet give the kingdom to Israel. And so in verse 18, John reminds him, it's the last time. And since it is the last time, many false Christs will be appearing. And then that's where we left off, that even in our own time now, as we have come full circle, the 2,000 years, the time that these people were living, didn't bring in the tribulation. God stopped the timeline and he went to the Apostle Paul to go to the Gentiles to call out the body of Christ. And when the body of Christ is complete, he will come back and finish the prophetic program with the nation of Israel. And of course, that means that everything that was in place back here is now getting in place once again. Now, I know I repeat, but I have to. And I, I know pre people appreciate that I repeat. Now, just as surely as when John and Peter and James were writing these, Israel was in the land, the city of Jerusalem was their capital, the temple was operating, and the Roman Empire was the empire that was over them, and so we have it again today. Israel, after the dispersion, is back in the land, they're back in the city, Oh, they haven't got the temple yet, but hopefully they will get that once the tribulation starts. And so everything is now reset and ready for the fulfilling of those final years. All right, so now let's pick up where we left off then. In uh, verse 19, speaking of those that went out from us, but they were not of us because they were not true believers. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued. But they went out. They turned their back, much like in Hebrews chapter 6, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Verse 20. Now we're picking up on new ground. But, John writes, you have an unction or you have a directive from the Holy One and you know all things. You know, as God reveals it. And uh, again, the Apostle Paul makes the same point, that it's our indwelling Holy Spirit who makes the difference. In fact, I guess I better go back and use the Scriptures. Come back with me to Romans, chapter 7. 
And while you're doing that, I'm going to have to apologize for my horrible math in the last half hour. I don't know what I was thinking, but a good thing you reminded me. Once in a while, I'll get a letter reminding me how I butchered the king's English. I didn't really know I did, but I guess I do. But uh, I don't butcher the English as bad as I did math last half hour. I, I don't know where my thinking was. But uh, anyway, it's 40 50-year segments that make 2,000, which means it would be 20 100-year-old people. Okay, I got that settled. So don't write and tell me. <laughs> okay, now back in Romans chapter 7, a couple key verses. 4, 5, and 6. Three key verses. 4, 5, and 6. Wherefore, my brethren, you also, Paul writes, are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. In other words, by his crucifixion. That you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. Now you see, Paul is always emphasizing the resurrection. It's not enough to believe that Christ died. It's not enough to believe that he was the Messiah. We have to believe that the Messiah, the Son of God, the Christ that died for our sins, rose from the dead. Otherwise, the gospel's not complete. All right, so he said that this one who is raised from the dead, that we should now bring forth fruit unto God. That is, because of our union with Christ. Now here it comes, verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions or the acts of sins which were by the law. In other words, the distinct things in the Ten Commandments that the unsaved people are guilty of doing day in and day out. And you know them as well as I do. Thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, so forth. Those were the acts of sins according to the law. And we all practice those things in one way or another before our salvation. All right. Come back to verse 5 again. For when we were in the flesh, before we were saved, before we had the indwelling spirit, the acts of sins which were by the law, worked in our members to bring forth fruit unto death, spiritual death, as we saw in the first program this afternoon, which, of course, will culminate with the great white throne. Now, verse 6. But now, in this age of grace, we are delivered from the law, being dead wherein we were held, in other words, the law could do nothing but condemn us. And Romans 3 makes that so plain that all the law could do was show us our sin. All right, so we were dead when the law was constantly condemning us. All right, but now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that now we should serve alive as believers... We should serve in newness of what? Spirit. What spirit? The Holy Spirit. And so you see, as soon as we come out from under that heavy hand of the condemning law and we're saved by grace, then instead of the law condemning us and holding us, we now have the Holy Spirit lifting us up and leading us and guiding us and keeping us from breaking that old law. And that's the part we have to understand, that now we are serving in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter or the law. It's a whole new ballgame, if we can put it in present-day vernacular. All right, now then, if you'll come back with me to 1 John. So we have, as well, we have this power and this leading of the Holy Spirit that gives us the knowledge that we need. But now let's come into verse 21. John says, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of truth. 
In other words, the two cannot mix. You can't have lying and truth. All right? Verse 22, who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. Now, let's compare. When I say that this is kingdom ground, and that these are kingdom believers, remember now that John is talking about recognizing who Jesus really is. All right, come back with me to Matthew 16. Now, those of you that are in my classes here in Oklahoma, you'll just about almost heave a sigh and say, oh, no, not again. Well, yeah, again. Matthew 16. <clears throat> Matthew 16. And this was the heart of the gospel of the kingdom. This is the heart of the kingdom economy. Now, they were under the law. The temple was still operating. Nobody had said, forget the law. But the crux of the moment was, who is Jesus of Nazareth? Who is he? All right. Matthew 16. Drop in at verse 13. It's at the end of the three years, and they've been performing miracles after miracle. And the multitudes have been addressed and have been fed. And now Jesus asks the question, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they, the twelve, said, Some say you're John the Baptist. Some, Elijah. Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, the spokesman, Simon Peter answered and said, Now watch this, and be ready to share this with people. This was the heart of the kingdom economy. And Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. Now, does Jesus upbraid him? Does Jesus scold him? No. He commends him. And look what he says. Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now that's the way it's been down through the ages. No man can believe the things that God says except the Spirit gives him understanding. And the same way today. You know, the question comes up all the time. Well, what happens first? Does a person become a believer and then the Holy Spirit enlightens? No. The Holy Spirit has to enlighten enough for that believer to see his sin and to see the truth of the gospel. And then the Holy Spirit comes in and, of course, gives us a full revelation and we have salvation. But here, even Peter would have never understood who Jesus of Nazareth was had not God himself revealed. And we see this throughout all of Scripture. All right, now then you can come all the way over into Acts chapter 8. I'll skip a couple of them, but we'll just hit a couple of the highlights. Acts chapter 8, we got the Ethiopian eunuch reading Isaiah 53. And again, the Spirit comes into the picture, tells Philip to get up alongside this fellow and show him what the Scriptures are talking about. And so he does. Verse 30. Acts 8, verse 30. Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. And he said, Understand what you read? And the eunuch responded, How can I, except some man should guide me? Well, then we find that verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and began at that same scripture, Isaiah 53, and preached unto him Jesus. Nothing about death, burial, or resurrection. Jesus. In other words, who he was. Who he was. And then it's obvious in the following verses. Verse 36, they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Well, goodness sakes, along with the preaching that Jesus was the Christ, what did John the Baptist begin with? Repent and be baptized. And so, Philip, no doubt, you've got to read between the lines, but no doubt Philip put that same premise before him, 
that had been part and parcel of Christ's earthly ministry. All right, so now then they come to water, and he says, What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said in verse 37, If thou believest with all thy heart, thou mayest. But believe what? Well, now you read on, and it's so clear. Man, these kids back here can understand this. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Period. Not a word about the cross. Not a word about resurrection. This is kingdom ground. And they were to believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be. He was the Christ. All right, I can back up to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, Peter has just healed the, the lame man. And goodness sakes, you don't have to have 10 years of seminary to understand this. This is plain English. Plain English. And they've healed the lame man. And the Jews of the day are all upset about how in the world Peter and John did it. Now that's enough to make you wonder, isn't it? This is only about seven weeks after the crucifixion. The crucifixion followed all his signs and wonders and miracles. So here are these Jewish people are all uptight. How did Peter and John perform such a miracle? And they couldn't remember eight weeks back? Unbelievable, isn't it? But all right, now then, in chapter 3, verse 16, Peter is explaining to these Jews on what power they healed this man. And it was his name, not his work of the cross, not his death, burial, and resurrection, but it's his name through faith in his name. Now the name only implied what? Who he was. And who was he? The anointed one, the Christ, the Son of God. Not a word about his death, burial, and resurrection, but it was through faith in his name that makes this man strong. Yea, it's the faith which is by him hath given this perfect soundness. All right, hope I've made my point. And let's come back now again to 1 John chapter 2. And so it's the same thing. If these Jews recognized that the one whom they had crucified was the anointed one, God imparted salvation to them. All right, but now verse 23. But whoever denied the Son, anyone who would deny that he was who he said he was, that person didn't have the Father. But he who acknowledged the Son... That Jew who could embrace Jesus of Nazareth as the Christ became in God's eyes a righteous individual. He was a believer and he was in the Father. Now verse 25. This is the promise that he hath promised us, that is the nation of Israel, even eternal life. These things I have written unto you concerning them that seduce you. Now, what does that mean? Lead you astray. So John is writing to these little groups of believers, these synagogues, as James calls them, these synagogues of Jewish believers who had recognized that Jesus was the Christ but, oh, there were just as many elements trying to lead them astray. Sound familiar? Oh, of course, same thing today. My, you're getting hit with everything but the kitchen sink. If I can believe what I hear. Now, of course, Iris and I don't have satellite, we don't have cable, and so we're immune to all that stuff. But I hear it from our listening audience. And I'm just aghast of what's out there. And it's 90% false. They're seducing people, see? Well, they were up against the same thing here. And the things I have written that concern them that seduce you. These false teachers, as Peter laid them out, and when we get the little book of Jude in a few tapings, 
He's going to do the same thing. Warn people about these false teachers. See? All right, now verse 27. But the flip side, the anointing which you have received of him, not the false teaching of the seducers, but the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. And you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and his truth, and is no lie, even as taught you, you shall abide in him. Now, does that sound like Paul? Does Paul ever say you don't need to be taught? Well, let's go back and look. Let's go back and look. Um, let's go back to Hebrews for a starter. Let's come back to Hebrews. Chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Now this isn't a contradiction. This is a change of modus operandi. John is talking to believing Jews who knew the Old Testament scriptures. They had been steeped in them. And as he could say, they, they don't have to be taught. But now look what Paul says. Verse, chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of the word of God, and you are become such as have need of milk. You don't know that much, and so you have to be fed like a baby. All right, now let's back up even further to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, chapter 3. 1 Corinthians, chapter 3. Drop in at verse 1. Y'all got it? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Now Paul says to these Corinthian believers up there in Corinth, Gentiles primarily, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. In other words, they had never come very far beyond their salvation experience. I have to write to you even as unto babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able, for you're still carnal. Does that sound like John when he said, you know all things? Why, well, anything but. These Corinthians had a long ways to go. They had a lot to learn. And so Paul says, you're still carnal, and your lifestyle is showing it, see? And there is among you envying and strife and divisions. Doesn't that show that you're carnal, and you walk as men? Well, anyway, I just like to show these comparisons from time to time and uh, make the difference between these Jewish epistles and Paul writing to Gentiles. All right, come back with me again to 1 John. Only got a couple minutes left. Verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him. Now remember, we went back to the, the vine and the branches, how that the believers in Christ's earthly ministry were already abiding in him, and God was in them, but on a different a different way than when Christ indwells the believer in the church age. All right, now verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear. What's he talking about? When he shall appear. The second coming. And they're expecting that in their lifetime, see? Oh, little children, when he shall appear, we may have confidence 
and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And I firmly believe that they thought that was in their lifetime. Be ready. Because he's coming back soon. Well, I can take part of it on chapter 3, but uh, we'll make that later. Come back with me again to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Now, they know nothing of the rapture. They know nothing of that sudden, silent disappearance of believers. They're waiting for the Lord to come down to the planet, to the Mount of Olives there in Jerusalem, and they're going to be seeing him face to face. And John is preparing them for his coming. All right, Acts chapter 1, verse 10. Acts chapter 1, verse 10. And this is at the ascension off the Mount of Olives. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up. Now he went up bodily. They saw him go. Not in some invisible spirit. He left bodily in that resurrected body with the nail prints on his hands that you remember Thomas touched and said, Oh, my Lord and my God. All right. In that body, he now ascends back to glory. And two men stood by them in white apparel, said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven, shall what? So come in like manner as you have seen him go. He's going to return bodily. All right, now let's go back to the Old Testament prophecy, Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah 14. Got to do this quickly. Just less than a minute left. Zechariah 14. Drop down to verse 4. And this is exactly what John is preparing his fellow believers for. Zechariah 14, verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day, the second coming, upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. The same Mount of Olives that we visit whenever we go. Same place. And his feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives, which before Jerusalem and East, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave. All right, this is what John is preparing them for. He's coming. And they had no idea it was going to be pushed out for 2,000 years. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.